My name is Charles Armour. I am President and Chief Executive Officer of the John Burt Society. I welcome each of you viewers to a brief program describing the purposes, principles, and programs of the Society. A great deal has been said and written about our Society with an inordinate amount of commentary being critical, and in far too many instances downright false. We have, however, survived these attacks and we've expanded our educational activities on many fronts because thousands of Americans like yourselves have taken the time to examine the real purposes, principles, and methods of our organization. Our strength is and always has been our commitment to open-handedness. We have no secrets or clandestine activities. Everything we do is out in the open, but at the same time, we respect the privacy of each of our members and will not barter or sell our roster. Our total strategy is education, and we meticulously adhere to the truth. We believe the vast majority of Americans agree with us that our political system, a constitutional republic, is the finest yet instituted among men to secure our lives, our liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. And that a free market economy and private enterprise offer the best means to pursue our happiness and enhance our prosperity and standard of living. And that a strong, sovereign, defensible United States of America is vital to the survival of our heritage. We believe, and we are sure you agree, that these foundations, which we define as Americanism, are under attack both at home and abroad. The success of our enemies of freedom depend heavily upon a misguided and uninformed populace. We believe that an informed electorate is the essential ingredient to responsible and intelligent citizenship. And our entire resources and energies are invested in this single purpose. But perhaps I'm getting somewhat ahead of the story, so allow me to introduce Mr. John McManus, a former Marine Corps officer and electronics engineer and a member of our staff for more than 20 years. He is an official spokesman for the Society and has appeared on television and radio on our behalf. He has lectured widely and writes a weekly syndicated newspaper column. His experience on our staff and as a member qualify him to give this presentation. Mr. John McManus. Ladies and gentlemen, in the relatively few minutes we have together, it is my purpose to discuss some of the problems facing all of us and then what the John Birch Society proposes to do about them. One of the best kept secrets of our time is the extent to which the United States has created its own enemy. While the people of our country have been made aware of growing Soviet military might on land, in the air, on the sea, even in space, very few realize that we ourselves have been communism's suppliers and that without U.S. help, communist power would be minimal, perhaps even non-existent. Of the many statements about U.S. equipment and technology now in the hands of the communists, there are two that dramatically demonstrate the gravity and extent of this scandalous situation. In his speech to the graduates of the U.S. Naval Academy in 1983, Secretary of the Navy John Lehman made the following startling assertion. Within weeks, many of you will be looking across just hundreds of feet of water at some of the most modern technology ever invented in America. Unfortunately, it is on Soviet ships. Such a chilling statement given to the newest offices of our nation's Navy should have captured the headlines the following day, but it received no attention whatsoever. One year prior to Secretary Lehman's address at Annapolis, Senator William Armstrong of Colorado pointed to one significant reason why our nation was spending such huge sums for our own military. He said, in the last 10 years alone, the United States and other Western nations have sold to the Soviet Union and its satellites more than $50 billion worth of technical equipment the communists could not produce themselves. In addition, the Soviets have been able to purchase entire factories designed and built by Western engineers and financed in large part by American and European banks. Once again, there was no coverage of sensational news, no headlines, no denials, nothing. America is now being threatened as never before, but the official response to that threat continues to include more transfers of equipment, technology, and credit to virtually every communist nation on Earth. But America is threatened not only by external forces, Anyone who has studied history knows that a nation, indeed a civilization, can destroy itself economically. And our nation is committing suicide in this arena on several fronts. First, 
from the most honest money in history, U.S. Treasury-backed gold certificates and then silver certificates, our leaders now give us totally unbacked paper currency whose value and quantity are controlled by the privately owned Federal Reserve System. Another area where we are destroying ourselves economically is where we are piling up federal indebtedness that now exceeds two trillion dollars. These are debts that will be paid by young Americans with their money or with their freedom. And a third area where economic suicide is evident is where layer upon layer of bureaucracy continues to stifle, control, and destroy our nation's ability to produce and compete for world markets. In the eighth century before Christ, the prophet Isaiah lamented, therefore is my people gone into captivity for want of knowledge. Had they been well informed, they would have been able to stay free. As you will see, it is the purpose of the John Birch Society to keep America from falling captive because the people of our nation had no knowledge. To put it in just a few words, it is our desire to wake the town and tell the people. But where did the John Birch Society come from? Who started it? What are its beliefs and goals? How does it operate? Robert Welsh, a retired businessman from Massachusetts, had been a student of history from the time he read a nine-volume history of the world when only seven years old. In 1952, he wrote the book, May God Forgive Us, about the U.S. government's betrayal of China into communist hands and the sacrifice of tens of thousands of American lives in the no-win Korean War. He saw destructive forces remove General Douglas MacArthur from the post of commander of U.S. troops in the Korean War. He watched as government officials and the national media shielded communists from public scrutiny. And in 1957, an accumulation of political trends and the steady concentration of power in the hands of big government, led him to predict that America would soon suffer from higher taxes, increasingly unbalanced budgets, skyrocketing inflation, greatly expanded government controls, and centralization of massive power in Washington. It was in 1956 that Robert Welsh converted his voluminous correspondence into a small magazine called One Man's Opinion. By 1958, he expanded it and renamed it American Opinion. In the September 1958 issue of American Opinion, he stood virtually alone in publishing the fact that Fidel Castro, still four months short of taking over Cuba, was indeed a communist. Mr. Welsh wrote, now the evidence from Castro's whole past that he is a communist agent carrying out communist orders and plans is overwhelming. Of course, for the record, Castro says he is not a communist and reminds you that the writers in the New York Times say he is not a communist. But in 1958, what could Robert Welsh do? His small magazine went to only a few thousand. Truth was being smothered in a flood of deceit and ignorance. What could one man do? Well, he could start an organization, not just a magazine, to wake the town and tell the people. But the key to any widespread effort to share reliable information was organization. Start with a few, work to create a snowball gathering size and momentum, bring information to the people, and keep the nation free. That was his goal. Make it a grassroots program with a strategy of education and a weapon of truth. Don't rely on the existing media. Start an entirely new medium of information, something that had never really been done before, an information agency whose members carried facts and perspective to others. It seemed an impossible task in such a large country and with so many powerful opponents arrayed against such a plan. But history was full of the impossible becoming a reality because of a determined few. Who was to say that success could not be achieved? Why not try? Robert Welsh did launch the John Birch Society in late 1958. In large measure, it was to be an information agency helping the American people to be better informed. But he made it more than just that. Yes, we do our best to wake the town and tell the people. But we also stimulate action based on the information we distribute. That action includes opposition to bad legislative proposals, repeal of existing bad law, and support for needed legislation consistent with the U.S. Constitution. Also, when good citizens are stimulated with correct information, political activity can be expected. The society itself never backs or finances any political candidate, but members acting as private citizens are always free to get involved in campaigns, and we do, with frequently striking results. Experience has clearly shown that pre-political education, the creation of an informed electorate, is a vital ingredient in achieving political victories. 
So we are an education and action organization. But we are also a school of thought and a university without walls, dedicated to free market economics, limited constitutional government, responsible citizenship, and opposition to all forms of tyranny, all of which we believe, with God's help, will lead to a better world. We have encouraged millions to look deeper than newspaper headlines, television news, and fashionable opinion, and to gain a historical perspective so that the present and the future can be judged by the past. The John Birch Society takes its name from the heroic U.S. Army Captain John Birch. In 1940, he left his Georgia home to do missionary work in China. During World War II, he volunteered for service with the U.S. forces, rose to the rank of captain, and became a legend in his own time as he rescued downed American pilots, reported on enemy troop movements, built airfields, and rallied resistance among the Chinese. Ten days after victory over the Japanese had been won, he was murdered in cold blood by Chinese communists. In his 1954 book, The Life of John Birch, Robert Welch wrote, with his death and in his death, the battle lines were drawn in a struggle from which either communism or Christian-style civilization must emerge, with one completely triumphant and the other completely destroyed. Sad to say, Christian-style civilization is losing this struggle, and too many Americans either don't realize that a struggle is even being waged or have no idea who the combatants really are. Even sadder to say, Freedom is in retreat, not because communism is more attractive or better able to produce or truly the wave of the future, not at all. Over 1.8 billion persons now live under communist rule in 49 separate nations. They are dominated by a force that repeatedly demonstrates its inability even to feed the people it controls. That same force, communism, has murdered over 100 million human beings in the 20th century and is still at it. Yet, it was America that built communist industries in the 1920s, supplied diplomatic legitimacy and credit in the 30s, made the USSR a world power in the 40s, and has for the past 40 years supplied massive amounts of equipment, technology, food, and credit to the Soviet Union and its satellites. That America could ever have helped communism in any way is tragic. That we continue to do so is intolerable. Beginning in 1959, the society started organizing local chapters across the nation. Our success in reinvigorating patriotic fervor, in identifying the dangerous growth of big government, and in exposing deficiency and treachery in the media drew little notice from opinion molders during our early years. But the society's impact was still very small compared to its impressive potential to reach and motivate the American people. If Robert Welsh's plans could ever be implemented, and a more informed, more involved core of determined, principled, and knowledgeable activists was created, the plans of collectivists and pro-communists would never stand a chance of realization. And so, all of a sudden, starting in early 1961, the press, magazines, radio, television, and numerous politicians, the very sources of the falsehoods about Castro, Mao Zedong, the United Nations, and a great deal more, put the John Birch Society on the front burner. The American people, most of whom had never even heard of our organization, were told in a flood of articles and reports that a new secret anti-American group had been formed and its name was the John Birch Society. Were the society's views shown to be false? No. Were any charges of lawbreaking levied? No. Instead, a withering campaign of smear was launched against the society and its members. We were labeled fascist, anti-Semitic, lunatic, extremist, and racist. Because of repeated mention of the society's name with unsavory groups like the Ku Klux Klan and the American Nazi Party, many Americans were led to believe that our organization was somehow linked to them, something our Jewish and black members have always been willing to disprove. But rather than tell you what we are not, we mean to tell you what we are, what we believe, what members of our organization do, and why your help is needed. We believe very strongly in Americanism, the core of which appears in the Declaration of Independence. There you will find the self-evident truth that men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. In 1776, our new nation began founded on a belief in God from whom we get our rights, not from a government that later could take them away, but from God who ordained that men should be free. The founding fathers also made it very clear that their fundamental purpose in creating government was to secure those rights and nothing more. 
try to teach all of that, including the part about God in a government school, and you'll begin to realize the need for a John Birch Society. We are also for enabling individuals to keep the fruits of their labor, the sanctity of the family, and a just peace. To those who argue that peace can only be achieved through an all-powerful world government, we caution that any world government powerful enough to enforce peace is also powerful enough to put an end to freedom. What do we oppose? We are completely against any form of totalitarianism and any watering down of the principles of Americanism that paves the way for totalitarianism. Yes, we are anti-communist, but we are also anti-socialist, anti-fascist, and anti-world government. A researcher recently showed that 35 million persons had died in all the horrible wars of the 20th century. But he also showed that unprovoked killings by governments during the same 20th century had accounted for 120 million violent deaths, over three times more. The lesson should be clear. War is not the worst calamity that can befall mankind. Total government is. And the best way to avoid mass killings at the hands of a Hitler, a Stalin, or anyone is to avoid too much government. Yet in America, government grows larger steadily. Even here, such a development should be feared. Yes, the John Birch Society opposes total government. But what does the society do? We do everything anyone would expect of an educational organization. We produce books, pamphlets, audio and videotapes, and a magazine called The New American. We have a remarkably busy speakers bureau and several ad hoc committees with branches formed at the local level. The society initiates petition drives and letter writing campaigns. And we have a chain of American opinion bookstores owned and operated by members in communities across the nation. What do the members do? That's just as obvious. Each is an information dispenser wherever he or she has influence. Each becomes the focal point of facts and perspective that will help others to understand what is happening to our nation and to ourselves. And each carries out all of this effort in an organized way. There are four levels of activity each member works at continuously. Self-education, education of others, opposition to moves that will build more government or sacrifice U.S. sovereignty, and of course, taking the offensive to restore and strengthen the foundations upon which this marvelous nation was built. So a member becomes a student and a teacher. He or she helps to organize speaking engagements and arrange for the ticket selling and audience building that each program entails. Members help to staff the society booth at a county fair, show videotapes at home or at someone else's home, raise funds for literature distribution, even build a float for a parade. During the summer, some members help to run our summer camps for young people, filling slots as counselors or instructors. And every member devises other moral, legal, and tasteful ways to create the understanding and distribute the knowledge that more Americans must have if we are to remain a free people. Experience shows that at a minimum, every active society member influences 100 others in the course of a year, 10 directly and the rest indirectly. If there were 1,000 members of the society in any congressional district, each one influencing 100 others per year, there would be at least 100,000 better informed individuals in that district every year. Would these persons make a difference in any election? Of course they would. And the enemies of the John Birch Society know of this potential far better than do its friends. It is that potential that so activates our detractors. The question is sometimes asked why a person should join our organization rather than just take advantage of the society's information. The answer is that activists who will spread what they know are needed far more than people who just want to know for their own satisfaction. If you join the society, the stimulus to reach out to others is always present. The job of bringing information to fellow citizens is always easier working alongside people like yourself than trying to do it alone. We don't want to be a well-schooled few. We want others, many others, to be well informed and motivated to take the kind of action needed to preserve freedom. Members draw strength from the organization and at the same time add to its strength. But the greatest reason for being part of an organization is to add more muscle to the concerted action program it recommends. There are scores of issues and dozens of causes that seem important. If every 100 activists picked one of these topics to focus upon, very few would get anywhere because each would be working practically alone. Summed up, the John Birch Society will help you solve problems you cannot solve by yourself. 
Members express confidence in the leadership of the society that supplies recommendations on how best to spend precious time, energy, and money. And when you and others in your community follow the carefully thought out agenda given in the monthly bulletin, you can be assured that tens of thousands of others in all 50 states are fighting the same battles on the same fronts. Their efforts magnify yours, and your efforts make theirs more effective. Add to all of this the trained professional field staff stationed all across the nation and experienced volunteers who serve as chapter and section leaders, something possessed by no other conservative or anti-communist group, and the value of our organization becomes obvious. But does the society's program work? Does it have any successes to show? The answer is that it certainly does. Let me list some of the victories brought about by the educational efforts of our members. The subversive and dangerous American Indian movement was exposed and now has just minimal influence. The Federal Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, a major step leading toward federalizing all local police power, was abolished. The dangerous Equal Rights Amendment was never ratified and has been widely repudiated. The incredible substitute declaration of interdependence was shown to be a complete repudiation of Americanism and went nowhere. The anti-American United Nations has been widely exposed and has seen its support dwindle remarkably. The Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission have been made controversial. The fundamental right to keep and bear arms has been protected. Members engaged in pre-political educational work have been responsible and were so named for the defeat of Senators McGee of Wyoming, Moss of Utah, Clark and Culver of Iowa, McGovern of South Dakota, Morgan of North Carolina, Bayh of Indiana, Gravel of Alaska, Church of Idaho, and others. Our trim committees and their efforts have been instrumental in demonstrating that some congressmen talk like skin flints at home, but vote like wild spenders in Washington, with the result that many big spenders have not been reelected. But the most important success of the society is the broad base of understanding it has created across America. No longer can the enemies of freedom count on near total ignorance as they have in the past. If the society continues to educate large numbers of Americans, the future will be far more secure. The formula for success is already written. The experience has been gained. That trained national field staff is already in place. And all that is needed is for those who are already working on our program to keep at it while many more Americans join us in this noble effort. How about you? If what you know about the society convinces you to join, we applaud your decision and we welcome your help. But if you are hesitant, please tell us what it will take to get you to commit yourself to action. Right now, the government of the United States is expanding its efforts to supply communist nations with more plans, parts, technology, and money. Having built the Soviet Union into a world power, our leaders are now doing the same for Red China. You don't want that. Right now, the U.S. government continues to pile up astronomical debts that are an immense burden today, but will be an even greater burden for younger Americans who have had no say about the wild spending spree that may cost them their liberty. You don't want that either. Right now, the U.S. government is steadily undermining the few remaining friends of our nation, even while doing nothing to harm and everything to help the true enemies of America. Do you want that? Right now, the U.S. government is building or strengthening more bureaucratic agencies and concentrating more power at the federal level. This is something else you don't want. Right now, the U.S. government is continuing arms control negotiations with communists who have broken virtually every pact they have ever signed, always to their advantage. What reasonable person wants this to continue? Right now, the U.S. government continues to entangle our nation in international pacts and agreements that violate our Constitution and threaten our national sovereignty. You don't want that either. And right now, the U.S. government is converting the government school system into a purveyor of atheistic humanism and a propaganda forum for peace at any price, even while academic performance hits new lows every year. I know you don't want that, but you are paying for it whether you like it or not. All of this is not happening by accident. It is not being done to us by some foreign power, and it is not wanted by the American people. If it is to be stopped, more than wishful thinking is needed, and soon. The creation of an informed electorate is what America needs so desperately. There are today countless millions scattered throughout scores of nations who are living lives as virtual slaves under totalitarian rulers. Many undoubtedly say to themselves or to each other if they dare, 
If I had only known, if there had only been someone to alert me, I would have worked and prayed, put my resources into the effort, and gotten others to do the same in order to preserve for myself and my family what I have lost. These bitter individuals had no place to go to find out what was happening to themselves and their country, but you do. They couldn't join an educational army to inform and motivate thousands, then millions, but you can. They had no access to an organization that publishes books and magazines, puts speakers on tour, distributes voting records of elected officials, and even helps them to teach their own children. But you do. Their lives are full of despair. But in America, hope surely exists. There is an organization. There is a reliable source of information and direction. And there are others already working to solve problems. And you can become a part of this unique undertaking. We need more pullers at the oars, more members of our society. As you consider making the kind of commitment that is sorely needed, consider that at its core, all of the problems we have discussed boil down to far more than political or economic preferences or to fear of losing the good life. What is being done by our government in our name is wrong. It's wrong to build communism abroad and socialism at home. It's wrong to betray allies who trusted America. It's wrong to steal the savings and the productive capacity of the people with excessive taxes, deficits, and inflation. It's wrong to drive God out of the government schools and away from the public's consciousness. It's wrong to declare unborn infants non-persons and permit a million and a half to be slaughtered each year. It's wrong to corrupt and control millions of individuals with government handouts. And if what government does is wrong, it is also wrong to do nothing about it. All of us should be aware of our moral responsibility to oppose evil. Let me suggest that you can meet a major portion of that responsibility through the non-church, non-religious organization we have formed. In no way do we intend to take the place of church, but we do intend to reinstill moral standards in the arena where government operates. And we are saying, if evil done in our name is not stopped, it will likely triumph and engulf all of us completely. As members of the society already know, I can promise a lot of hard work, but also a tremendous amount of satisfaction. I can promise an occasional social rejection, but also a whole new circle of valuable friends. I can promise frustration that comes when your efforts draw a blank with some, but also exhilaration that comes when you are thanked by others who will now stand by your side to wake more towns and tell more people. I feel fairly confident that I can promise something else too. Just as Americans are proud if their ancestors came to our shores on the Mayflower, or if their people were among the 56 signers of the Declaration, or if a distant relative stood with George Washington at Valley Forge, and they should be proud, those who come after you will be proud of you because you helped to sound the alarm. You were a member of the John Birch Society when it took courage and when freedom was threatened. Thank you for hearing our story. Let me close as the late Robert Welsh often closed his many presentations about our society with the simple urging to men and women of goodwill everywhere, come join us in our proud companionship and in our epic undertaking.